so I cannot possibly do justice, I think, to um, <laughs> to what all of you who are seen now on our panel have created in your lives. Um, but I'll give little highlights. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the power of the written word um, and specifically how literature can build and rebuild ties. So I think this idea of regeneration that you brought up, Scylla, is super relevant to, to our panel. And, um, and we'll get to hear from, uh, from, let's see, five pretty incredible women. Um, so our moderator, Mevash Amin, really great to have you here. Thank you. Um, Mevash is a Pushkart nominated poet. Um, she's been published in many international journals and books. Um, and she's also the editor and publisher of the Aleph Preview. Um, so thank you for being here. I'll briefly give just a brief introduction of each of you and then I'll hand it over to you, Mevash. Um, so next, Natasha Badwar. Really great to have you, um, Natasha is a filmmaker, um, a columnist, author, and is the media team lead at um, Karwan e Mohabat, and I'm sure I mispronounced that, um, so please correct anything that I get wrong. Um, and I think also I've been very moved, Natasha, by, by what you've been doing to build bridges, um, especially between the Muslim and Hindu communities um, in India and beyond. And Preeti, wonderful to have you. Preeti Gill is the founder and managing trustee of um, Maja House in India and, um, and just such a voice for cross-cultural connections. So um, it's, yeah, love it. I, I recently learned about your work actually through the summit. So I've been learning a lot, you know, the literature that you bring together, music, ideas. And I know, Preeti, also that you have a connection to the Twin Cities. So I hope that can come up maybe in the panel. Um, you have such personal life experience with this as well. Thank so you. briefly, thank you, Preeti. Um, I want to also introduce you all to Sheila, Amoni, and Alice. So Sheila Reddy um, is a longtime book critic and author of a very beloved book, um, more than this, but very beloved book, um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jana, um, who are obviously the creators of, Pakis of um, Pakistan. And, um, and Sheila, I know some people are known as kingmakers, where their praise of a book or of a creation can make kings. I feel like we should be calling you a queen maker. <laughs> and, um, and so I know, you know, over 25 years um, of your work in journalism and storytelling. So just really honored to have you. Um, Alice, uh, Alice Albinia is joining. Hello, Alice Hi. from the UK. Um, and is an award-winning author and scholar of South Asian history. Um, I also want to give a shout out, Alice, I know you have a new book coming out mm -hmm. um, in June, um, Quinn, which is set, sounds super interesting, so it's set in a um, fictional um, archipelago off the east coast of um, Britain that comes under female rule, so this might be a good book to to stimulate our imaginations. Um, mm -hmm. And also, Alice, I just want to say, in case it comes up in the panel conversation, I know you personally um, traveled following the path of the Indus River, mm -hmm. to India and Pakistan, which is just an experience that not many people get to or have done. So I hope we get to touch on that. And um, last but not least, Moni, so good to have you here. Um, Moni Mosin is a columnist, um, best-selling novelist um, from Pakistan. I'm sure many of you know Diary of a Social Butterfly. Um, and that's just one of the books, uh, Moni, that you have created. I know your works have been featured all over. So Times of India, The Garden, The Economist, um, much, much more. So that was a lot of talking. I know that kind of is the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of the work that you all have been doing. Um, but I will now give Scylla and I permission to turn off our videos and just listen. And Mevash, I will stop talking and hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, Ekta, I wanted to thank you for this wonderful opportunity to meet so many amazing women. 
and uh, I'll, I'll start with uh, um, uh, Sheila Reddy, who I met, I, I remember, at, uh, at the Karachi Literature Festival in um, some a couple of years ago. And uh, Sheila, in your own words, um, Mr. Jinnah has been valorized on one side of the border and villainized, uh, you said, on the other. Now, I understand why you wrote about him, because he's quintessentially a Bombay wala. But what I would like to, uh, you to tell you, the audience is, do you think it has helped reduce the image of him as a villain um, who bifurcated India in India and built a better understanding of him, the book, I mean? And in Pakistan, do you feel that your book has helped create a more 3D vision of him away from the legendary and inscrutable kind of a cardboard figure that most Pakistanis see him as. So that's my first question to you. I wanted to say, because while Silla was talking, it occurred to me that uh, uh, it was a yin book without my knowing it was a yin book in the sense of, uh, you know, I was interested in knowing the personal side of Jinnah uh, because especially because it was so difficult to uh, uh, marry the the story of his personal life with what what had happened what i understood of his politics so it mm -hmm. began as a personal journey for me to try and figure out uh, the man behind the politics and uh, i must confess that i came to him uh, as the other he was not, he, when I began the book, he was not somebody I could relate to because I'd grown up with this image of him as, as the cardboard villain somehow. So yeah. uh, it was only after my first trip to Pakistan as a, as a researcher to research the book because I couldn't unearth anything about him in India. And I kept putting it off thinking that I'll find everything I want to know about Jinnah once, once I reach Pakistan. But when I went there, I realized very soon that I had fallen into the same trap of othering him that, uh, that, uh, that uh, I, I felt that India had done to him. And it was the Pakistani historians who pointed out to me that he's basically, he lived his life in India. So you will find what you want in India. You have to go back to India. And look. so that's when it struck me that uh, this is what I'm doing in my head. So I went back and I began to see him as one of us, not the other, but you know, one of the national leaders and then the politics that came out of it. And that made a big difference to my picture. So it was basically for me a personal process of trying to uh, find the elusive Jinnah, the person that had evaded all his biographers before. And it was only after the book was published that uh, I realized to my delight that uh, it had such unwittingly, I had not, I had not had this purpose in mind, but it had unwittingly touched the chord on the other side of the border. And I realized that this was because uh, he was the founding father of Pakistan, yes. but somehow was such a distant figure. He had become something, the name of universities or the name of, you know, roads like Gandhi had become. But Gandhi had left a lot of literature of 100 volumes of his letters behind. So you had a sense of, you know, every red dream that Gandhi had would get into the newspapers the next year. Right? So you knew a lot more than you wanted to know about Gandhi. And here was this absolute uh, opposite because he just didn't want his personal side to be known. So it came as, as I was honored to find that I did serve a purpose because uh, it made a younger generation, I think, uh, can get closer to a very distant father figure to understand what he's all about. So it helped me, you know, it, it helped me that I was in search of his personal side and 
I did that. Now, a question that often comes up, uh, and I find this quite striking on either side of the border is, uh, at every book event, the first question I get asked is, what is the reaction on the other side? Uh, you know, it's like they can't believe that a jinnah they can relate to in one country can also be related to on the other side. It's like, because, because the, the divide in the image is so much, but actually, uh, so to, uh, the short answer to your question is yes, he seems to be so much of a villain in India and he became more of a 3D figure in, in Pakistan. Pakistan. Yeah. So, so do, do you think that after your book was written, it, uh, did you actually feel uh, perceptions shifting a bit with people you came across, people who had read the book? Uh, did they, they say that they had uh, kind of changed his op their opinion about him? Yes, yes, very much so, very much so. Uh, uh, in the sense that I started getting, uh, uh, when I went, it came to Pakistan uh, for, for the first lit uh, it it was quite clear that uh, people uh, had, uh, like the book, but even before that, I was getting some mail from people who had read it in advance saying that, uh, uh, thanking me for writing a book which brought them closer to, to their father figure. Father. And in India as well, do you feel that, you know, the kind of uh, uh, image he had yes. was slightly uh, uh, softened? Yes. Yeah. Especially a younger generation, which is, uh, they are surprised that uh, here was, uh, you know, it's very easy to understand in the current situation what had happened to Jinnah and the Congress Party in 1918, because yeah. the same thing keeps repeating itself. So yeah. it, it's easy to understand. Uh, and a lot of young people tell me that, uh, you know, oh, uh, how come we didn't read this in our uh -huh. book then, you know? So. And the second question that I want to ask you is uh, that at a time when there are almost no direct connections between India and uh, Pakistan, I mean, the borders are closed and, uh, you know, and even books are difficult to get across. Uh, um, how exactly can women in particular build bridges through literature or any other way that you can think of? You know, I've, uh, I think women have been building bridges. We have been, uh, we have been uh, uh, bearing witness to our internal life and what can be more interesting for each of these countries than the internal life of what's going on across the border. Because in some way it has a deep poignancy that we don't have in the literature of any other country because it's like, you know, it's like those old Bollywood uh, uh, tales of Jurwa band kind of thing. And you want, you want to know you're separated at birth and then, you know, you're meeting as grown up. So you want to know what's going on in your head. And, and I think we were doing pretty good, but then uh, unfortunately government intervene and, and there's a period of, uh, you know, not exchanging, because I felt that uh, the Indian publishing houses were doing a good job of, and, and they were doing it for commercial reasons, because the Pakistani uh, books are very, very popular here. You know, yeah. they have a place, yeah. they, they have a, a definite uh, role to play, because we want to understand, we are interested in what's happening. Just like we used to be interested in the Pakistani serials, uh, on TV. Know, I don't know if you were born then, but it's uh, uh, years ago that that used to be so huge. I yes. remember when I first came to Delhi, my landlady, who, who who was one of the Punjabis who came after partition, she was addicted to these serials. So it's very interesting <laughs> how you brought in this uh, uh, this thing between uh, you know literature and uh, TV as well, and and I guess you're right there. 
So, uh, uh, also, I would like to uh, now, I think, uh, uh, in the interest of time, go on to the next uh, uh, next person, and then we'll have you back uh, uh, towards the end for any questions and answers. So, that is Preeti Gill. Uh, hello, Preeti. Hi, hi. How are you? <laughs> All good. In a cold Delhi, yes. Yeah, it's very cold <laughs> here in Lahore as well. I guess we have that in common, just yeah. very short distance uh, away from each other. And uh, uh, Preeti, uh, um, you're a publisher and uh, you have concentrated on some very sobering issues relating to women and uh, conflict, as well as the widow which is uh, traditionally the dark half of womanhood in traditional Hinduism. But on the other hand, you've, you've uh, created this upbeat and uh, amazing, welcoming haven in, in Amritsar called Majha. And it's a beautiful house. You sent me the sort of uh, pictures and things with the cafe and you have uh, a weekly uh, cafe soirees there, I believe, and you have uh, biannual literary and cultural festivals. And then on the other hand, you also have an initiative called Sanja Punjab. And uh, that brings together uh, Punjabis from India, Pakistan, and the diaspora. Uh, for the August Sanja Punjab, for example, you, uh, the theme was a tale of two cities. And uh, uh, you invited Harun Khalid from Lahore, my city, and Saif Mahmood from Delhi uh, to speak about the two cities and their people and the architecture and the art and the poetry, etc. So I wanted to know, are these your vehicles for disseminating peace and understanding between the two countries? Uh, tell us more about all this and whatever. Yeah, so uh, basically, uh, I think I'll tell you two stories. One, of course, being personal, being my own story, uh, uh, as I think we've been talking about a little bit earlier as well, when Ikta introduced the entire um, uh, summit. Um, a lot of us come from partition families. And for me, it's been the same thing. My mother and her family came across from Apatabad. So we've grown up listening to all these stories of partition, their stories and their songs, whatever my mother and grandmother told me, they became our stories and our songs. So they've sort of filtered into our own lives. So that's been there on one level. And then of course, my story of being in the publishing world uh, bringing to life stories mainly of women and of marginalized voices because I was working with a feminist publishing house in Delhi. And uh, within that also, I had this great interest in um, regions and languages which are sort of peripheral. So the Northeast for some reason attracted me a great deal. I did, uh, um, um, I mean, I visited a few times and then I've done some uh, conflict uh, related stuff there with women. Uh, so that exposed me to a lot of writing which was uh, present there, but which, but which had not come to the so-called Indian mainland. And that started it off and we built a really strong list of women writers from the Northeast. And uh, so for me, it's always been that fiction is a space for uh, exploring and you know, you're not bogged down by politics. You can actually go to a new world, look at a new perspective, look at regions, build understanding through writing and through the word, through, through reading about people. Um, and so when uh, about 2018 March, when we decided to open up our house in Amritsar as a public space, uh, as a platform for literature and culture and art, because there was no such space. And I always felt that Punjab and the perception of Punjab um, in the rest of the country is uh, pretty weird because everybody seems to think there's only agriculture and no culture and you know all that kind of rubbish so that you don't have any intellectual capital in Punjab and uh, it used to really gall me and usually irritate me that you know how is this possible and there was a time when Lahore was um, you know the city of culture you had the best writers the best literature coming out of there and um, just this morning, a friend sent me a whole list of people who were born in Pakistan and uh, after partition moved here. And it's, you know, some of the greatest writers, filmmakers, actors, all of that. So how is this possible? So it was also an effort to try and put Punjab center stage. When we were looking for a name for the place, we chose to call it by its location, which is the Maja region of Punjab. Maja, of course, included um, Gurdaspur, it included Lahore. 
And that was the intent that at some point it would be the larger Maja re region, which would again take its, you know, sort of uh, center space. Um, Maja, of course, is the, used to be the heartland when it was undivided Punjab and it was a much larger area. And um, so, I mean, once uh, we started moving, so I mean, moving between Delhi and Amritsar, it always seemed to me like Amritsar was that border, the, you know, Vaga and the border being so close. It's like a living thing over there. You've not forgotten partition. Those stories are still there. People are still there. And I remember the first, uh, uh, we opened with the festival in March, but then we had our next event to do with Jalya Malabagh in April of 2018. And there were, the three, uh, there were these three elderly um, people who had come from the world city and they were talking about uh, members of their family who'd lost lives uh, during Jalya Malabagh. And they had photos and you know drawings to show. And then one of them at the end of the session just came to me and said that, you know, what a fabulous name you've chosen because it connects at once. This is the heart of Punjab. So I think beginning from there to trying to create this space which talks about the stories which exist there and which may have been pushed somewhat to the background, but which are very much there. Uh, so we've been having a lot of standalone events, uh, bed hugs. Uh, you know, we've done bed hugs on almost all the major writers and poets. We did one with uh, on Fez when the uh, his daughters also joined us through uh, you know through uh, through the internet. So there's a connection when we opened this cafe that you just mentioned. It's called Kikli Cafe. Uh, when we opened it, it's a library and we have um, discussions there as well. Uh, was also with a, a writer from Pakistan who lives in New Delhi. So. I know that there's a connection, there's curiosity, there is, you know, interest, and there is a desire to know more. So all of that translates into uh, a full house for us, you know, people want to know more. So everything that you may think that the border is closed and there are no visas and we cannot travel, I don't think we've let it stop us. So especially when uh, pandemic broke out and we started this internet connection, so you do things by Zoom and all that, so I guess that... Now we do them by Zoom, yes. Yeah. But whenever we've had an author visiting, for example, um, we had Puna Mayub come with, you know, when she had her book out, um, The Begum. Uh, we invited her then, and again, it was the same thing. We did, an, we did one session at Maja House, we did another at the Guru Nanak Dev University, and both were, you know, they were really... Uh, went very well. So this whole idea of building a larger Punjab between East, West and the diaspora, language plays a big part. So we speak in Punjabi, we speak in uh, Hindustani, we speak in Urdu. Um, and we try and make language and the shared history, the shared heritage, folk tales, food, all of that part of the conversations. Um, and of course, the other thing is to involve as many uh, young people as possible because we want it to go forward if you want to hand over this feeling um, you need to involve young people and so I think Ikta's effort this particular thing is really excellent so I'll stop there right now okay but once uh, things become better uh, do you think you will increase that traffic from say Lahore or other parts of Pakistan uh, uh, to Maja and to have more initiatives so that you can disseminate this kind of peace and uh, feeling of like uh, like Ekta said that you know she comes from Lahore and my father happens to come from Allahabad and uh, I've been there three times and uh, when I was a kid and you can't really uh, you can't shut off the the, uh, the origins where you come from you can't shut them off and I often whenever I hear the word Allahabad I, I I think of that those visits to my grandfather etc so will you so it's a very great a good way of of uh, uh, people to people contact directly can be a very good thing so are you going are you thinking of doing that in the future to uh, further this kind of uh, peace and the, the the peace that we are talking about in the subcontinent no, definitely. I mean, I don't think that it ever started with this very grand idea of building peace like that. It was more like building the friendship that you already have, nurturing the bonds that already exist. And like I said, because uh, I don't feel them when I'm in Delhi so much, but definitely when I'm in Amritsar, it's like it's just 30 odd kilometers away. And 
there is this thing that pulls you there all the time. Mm-hmm. A long time ago, you probably know there was that little village called Preetnagar, which is exactly, uh, which was conceived of as being this village uh, fostering peace and and uh, Preet uh, uh, love uh, between the two. And it was built uh, equidistant between um, Lahore and Amritsar. And uh, now, of course, it's just about seven kilometers from the border. And uh, it has seen really bad days. But that's the kind of thing. I mean, I'm, I'm not <laughs> saying that we are making another Preet Nagar, but definitely a place where uh, you have a platform, place that is non-threatening, where you can come and question, where you can certainly come and ask and debate and discuss all kinds of issues. So definitely, once it opens up, I would be uh, you know, delighted to uh, do a festival around our common heritage and our common writing and maybe also take a Maja House festival across to Lahore at some point. I mean, it that would be fantastic. Yeah. That, I think that's a, an idea worth uh, giving more thought to and we would all help you uh, over here. Thank you. And I'm going to go on to the next, uh, uh, next speaker and that is uh, Natasha Padwar. You are uh, placed in a unique place to foster understanding between religions. Because you are a Hindu media professional and you're married to a Muslim. And I've read some of your pieces just in the last few days and you write uh, delightful columns about, uh, you know, family and parenthood and the singular dilemmas of an interfaith family. And some of them are really, I mean, they really touch home. I mean, you know, even though, I mean, I don't know that feeling, but you, you managed to bring it across. And uh, you're also the media lead for the people's campaign Karwane Mohabbat, which is out to build peace between communities in India. So do you think that writing and causes such as yours make a discernible difference in India towards communal understanding what you've written and what you, the books you've written and even just the example of you being an, you know being part of an interfaith couple and writing about it? Um, yeah, so I, um, I did begin writing um, these essays that eventually became a column and then, event- uh, and then became a book yeah. uh, after my children were born. Um, and uh, I, I kind of, um, you know, my creative expression moved from filmmaking uh, and documentary filmmaking to writing. Um, because uh, motherhood was something that kind of brought with it a churn, uh, a a search for, um, uh, you know, a a more authentic expression uh, and a a desire to put into words, to be able to process all the contradictory, um, uh, you know, emotions and feelings and conflicts that one was dealing with. Uh, while one was wallowing in this, you know, love for one's children, there was also, the, the, you know, the, there's so many uh, kind of uh, stories that hit you immediately, and you haven't heard them from anyone else. Mm. And, uh, you know, uh, so th- that became a kind of, a, a, it became very important for me to start writing those for myself. <laughs> um, the, the story that I never intended to write was that of my interfaith marriage. Uh, I didn't feel uh, that there was anything exceptional about it. I didn't, um, you know, that I didn't see a story in it, uh, except that <laughs> um, the world made a story of it uh, in the last uh, eight years. The the way in which. Um, it has, uh, you know, interfaith love in India, particularly relationships between Muslims and Hindus and love relationships between Muslims and Hindus have been exceptionalized, criminalized, victimized. Uh, it was like, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you, you grew up in the 80s, uh, you kind of step into the 21st century, you're very certain that you are a modern woman in a modern world. And, and you know, there's, there's nothing to talk about and suddenly you're thrown back into uh, what, what, what you understand as a very, very, you know, as the dark ages where, um, is it possible? How do you live? How do you speak? What do you eat? I mean, those, those kind of questions come back into 
uh, drawing room conversation and uh, people, you know, because, because it's been politicized in the way that uh, we have all witnessed its politicization in India, um, uh, not only in the last eight years, but even a little uh, going back. Um, so I, I, I felt that this is not something that one can stay silent about, that this is a story that needs to be normalized all over again. And uh, when I first, um, so we've heard the term love jihad. I'm, I'm sure it's uh, traveled across the border. Yeah, it has. Uh, you know, much, much to the shame. <laughs> uh, Terrible things everywhere. So it's... Uh, yeah, but when, when this term was first coined, I think 2015 or 2016, it began to get popular. Mm -hmm. The first time I wrote about it, I was, I was joking. I was laughing it off I, and, and I was, I was claiming it. I was saying, I am a love jihadi and what do you want to do about it? Uh, you know? Brave um, of you. <laughs> I mean, it didn't feel like a brave thing to do. You were just scoffing at a ridiculous idea. Yeah. It's just that as, as uh, you know, the, uh, a, as uh, the, the, the right wing has gained political power and has managed to kind of spread its venom uh, socially it, it, into society and uh, normalized hatred in uh, everyday conversation. Yeah. I mean, then it kind of slowly begins to become something uh, very exceptional, very brave. Uh, and um, so, so this is a kind of a, a, a private story that, be, that had to be thrust into the public arena. Mm -hmm. uh, not because I uh, ever thought that there was any, you know, there was any story in it, but because it just became important to talk about it more and more. Mm -hmm. And um, over the years, um, you know, ha having been a media person myself, there have been many times when there have been, uh, you know, calls for interviews or um, wanting to feature you in a documentary. And as a couple, we have always rejected those requests. We have always said, no, you're not going to do any Numaish. We are not going to participate uh, in this. There's nothing, uh, you know, uh, we, we are not going to uh, participate in the narrative. But, uh, but we find ourselves today in a place, and particularly in the last three months, ever since the laws have been changed in the state of Uttar Pradesh to literally criminalize uh, interfaith love. We find ourselves in a webinar, in a television interview, in in uh, you know uh, in in one's um, uh, articles online, constantly talking about it and constantly uh, needing to say that this is uh, okay, this is uh, not something that we are going to allow uh, to be pushed in the corner, to be marginalized and criminalized in this way. Uh, so it's it's born of necessity. And, uh, and and we'll, you know, we'll, 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 we will stand on pedestals and tell the story so long as it is. But you, you, so do you come across people who thought a certain way, perhaps? Like I was reading that story of your, that little column of yours about, you know, you trying to book a room in Amritsar with a couple for your husband who, uh, were, you know, when they found out he was a Muslim, then, uh, you, you know, they became, they said, okay, we want the, the whatever, I, I, I don't know, they became a bit uh, uh, removed. And, uh, and uh, so uh, anecdotally, can you, I mean, talk about like a few people who might, by your writing or by your initiatives, have uh, changed their mind? I, I can tell you uh, with, um, with great confidence uh, mm -hmm. what it does influence. Okay. Uh, for me, it became important uh, to write, and many of the stories come from incidents that took place uh, in the lives of, uh, you know, the, the five of us in our family. Yeah. Uh, one of the first ones came from uh, my daughters coming back from the neighborhood park and saying, oh, you know, we met this child who said, are you a Pakistani? And I said, uh, no, no, my cousin's a Pakistani. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> The Karachi cousins. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my, my so the kids had been recognized as Muslims and the word Pakistani had been used as a slur to okay. insult them. And okay. they had only known this Indo-Pak family of theirs. So, so they thought, oh, uh, maybe you misunderstood. I'm not from Karachi. I'm from Delhi is the answer they gave. Yeah. But, but what they brought home uh, to, to, to my horror 
was, uh, you know, blatant Islamophobia in the playground in my posh neighborhood uh, in Delhi. Mm -hmm. you, you, you really mm -hmm. think that your class, your privilege, your education, your location in history is going to protect you from, mm -hmm. uh, from a whole lot of, uh, you know, prejudices that belong to the past, but right. you, you discover that they don't, and then you have to negotiate with them. Yeah. So one of the things it has done, uh, the writing has done is, um, is give the children a very confident voice. Wonderful. Uh, you know, uh, so they, so they, they know um, that we must remain confident. We must not allow anybody to push us back and, and that we are fine with our identity and we are going to flaunt it. Okay. Another thing that I find, is, you know, is that people who, who want to have the confidence but don't because they've been told times are not good, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't talk like this, don't speak like this, don't like statuses uh, that are too liberal, uh, hide your political affiliations. They get, I, I hear a lot from people who say, your writing gives me the courage to speak my mind. That's so, wonderful. That's really so, wonderful. So that's, that's one thing. And with the Karwani Mohabbat also, uh, the Karwani Mohabbat is a people's campaign that was announced uh, about a year and a half after the first lynching took place okay. uh, in India. Okay. So 2015 onwards, we began to uh, witness a series of what seemed to be isolated cases of lynchings of Muslim men. Mm. And usually there would be some accusation of having killed a cow or having attempted to hurt a cow. But we began to feel, uh, you know, a large group of citizens began to feel that there was a pattern in this and that we had, uh, now that the state was no longer cooperating in helping victims of hate crimes, that civil society had to step up. Okay. So we began to tell those stories, um, highlight those stories, um, reach out to those victims. Mm. And, and again, that helped to give a voice to many people who were also similarly feeling isolated. That's wonderful. It's really heartening to hear your stories and uh, uh, I'm going to make it a point to somehow get your books and read them as well. Thank and Thank you so much. And I, I shall move on to Alice Salbinia. And uh, hi, Alice. Hi. I have read your book and, uh, you know, uh, Empires of the, uh, the Indus and I loved it. I just absolutely mm -hmm. loved it. And uh, you. Uh, you, I believe you've written another novel while after your stay in Delhi as well. Mm -hmm. Something Leela's book. Yeah, Leela's book. Leela's yeah. book, yeah. So you stayed in Delhi for about two years, yeah? Yeah, before writing Empires of the Indus, in fact. Yeah, that was one of the things that gave me the idea to write the book. Okay. So, but, mm -hmm. uh, but for the first two book, you must have traveled, obviously, you traveled through Pakistan as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you are the only non-Indian and non-Pakistani author on our panel. Mm -hmm. And as, as somebody who is uh, not, I mean, not uh, ethnically from here, I would like to ask you as an, as an, well, not an outsider because you've, you know, you've been in this uh, uh, milieu, but uh, about the things that do you seem to bring us together as two, uh, two countries and seem, things that seem to drive us apart from each other? Because well, I think you've... I think you've all been been vocalizing it. You know, everything brings you together, um, and the only thing driving you apart is the border and the politics. But otherwise, um, so did, did you notice a lot of similarities between people? What is your perception of? Uh, so my perception was was I'd lived in India for two and a bit years, and I'd worked for for different, you know, Biblio and and Outlet Traveler and CSE. I'd you know I'd been been working in India, but I got the idea to write this book while I was sitting in Nizamuddin West, where I lived. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I went back to Britain to do an MA, a funded mm -hmm. MA, which I tailored to be about this book and about the next one, um, the novel. And nevertheless, at the point where I was going to go to Pakistan for the first time, which was probably 2003, yeah. I felt very confident. But I then began to get comments from my friends, from people I knew, you know, should you really be going to Pakistan? Um, I wrote to um, a friend from Biblio who put me in touch with somebody in Karachi. Um, and I said, I want to come and write this, you know, I'm researching this book. And 
and he wrote back saying you really shouldn't come or if you do you must have an armed guard and you must you know you mustn't take a taxi or a bus and he was really kind of scaremongering from from within Pakistan and later he wrote said you know actually maybe I was overreacting but that was the response I got at the time and I and and what I want to get across is that you know these things they're not nothing they do have an effect on people yes. there is this it's really amorphous but it but it exists this kind of thing that when you say the name Pakistan there's just people get you know there is this kind they, of scaremongering they, yeah and then they, and I, I huh I agree with you, very scared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have to step into that space. You know, if I, I there's two things I remember clearly. One is the moment that I arrived at Karachi Airport. I, I booked this really cheap flight, I arrived at four in the morning. I had this address from this um, contact at Biblio who's, who had um, married a Pakistani woman and they were living in the States, but he sent me the, the lawyer's address and the lawyer put me in touch with the journalist and the journalist put me in touch with her um, parents who lived in Seaview by the by the sea on the Arabian Sea and I had this one address and I went out into the airport and I and I um booked a taxi and this guy with this big long beard you know he was like if you wanted to put a textbook Pakistani man who might abduct you you would have chosen him and the moment I began speaking Urdu to him which in those days was better than now all my fears fell away it was like it was just like total bliss I got into the taxi he took me through this very quiet kind of stirring city five in the morning you know and I, and I relaxed, I just relaxed. And I told myself, I then kept on encountering, you know, fear from the people I met. Where are you going? You're going outside Karachi, you're going into the interior of Sindh, this yeah. really scary place full of bandits. And I just said to myself, look, you can live with this paranoia and then you won't do anything, or you can just be sensible, you know, meet people eye to eye, um, decide who you're gonna trust. Yeah, don't trust everybody, because that would be stupid, but you know, be sensible, these people are, human beings and either you're going to be totally scared for three years while you're researching this book or you're just going to relax and and it's going to be fine and of course it was fine um but but i think a lot of it is mental i mean the more i saw of um of the of the culture i'd known in india and the culture i encountered in 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 pakistan it, it's tragic that there's this border in between i had to do these ridiculous journeys all the way around you know to get to to um from one side of the river to the other i had to come down yeah. to Raga when I was up in the mountains and I wanted to just go across at the, the line of control, that would have been the simple thing. I actually saw <laughs> India from the Pakistan side. Um, I had to come all the way down, go across Raga, go all the way up. Um, and of course, the deep history and the deep geography and the deep culture, that's what it's about. It's in, 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 on the Indus you have, it's not even religion that's dividing people because you have shrines on the river yes. um, that, have Hindus going to them and have Muslims going to them and the Muslims are saying it's a river saint and the Hindus are saying it's a river god but it's the same the same place yeah. and those people that was the last thing I expected from a visit to Pakistan to be shown the syncretism of 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 South Asia that was really amazing and that's that's still there nothing has been able to of course there have been efforts by the by the state and by various other bodies to erode that syncretism but wow, it exists and it's still there. And, and that's what everybody has to cling on to. Yeah. How much time did you spend in Pakistan on, for, on that, for that particular book? Well, I first went there in 2003 and I um, used to do kind of trips of around four months. And then I would go back to the British Library and do more research. So 2003, four, five, about four, uh, four years. 2006, I was in Tibet at the okay. source of the Indus. Okay, all in all about four years. Mm. Okay, that's, that's yeah, quite coming a, and going. Yeah. And you must have made friends there and you must have, uh, uh, you know, you have uh, uh, moorings there in Pakistan now? So yeah, totally. I would just went back recently because I had to write an essay for a National Geographic and it was so amazing going back. It was almost surreal. It was, it was like being in a dream. You know, there were so many things that were, were the same and, um, and yet obviously, the people I was kept thinking to myself, these people, this man I'm in a taxi with, he's driving this taxi, you know, he's now 50 years old. When I was there, you know, it was kind of, I had to kind of rewind everything in my head and, yeah. and think yeah. it was, it was wonderful. Yes. Okay, great. As going according to the, the, the theme of this webinar, mm. as, a, as a woman who's been to both countries and do you feel that, feel that women might be better placed to build more lasting ties? whether through literature, whether through, I mean, you have in a way because you have kind of written a book which has connected 
the Indus, which joins the two countries, and you've written about your experiences along the way and everything. But do you think that women are better placed to do uh, do that? I mean, uh, than I, men. I, I think that the, <laughs> this is what the world needs now. I mean, you know, <laughs> we, this is where we should be going: female leadership. I, I, yeah. I'm not somebody who who personally who wants to lead, but I can see that this is what this is what needs to happen. And actually, it was the process of writing Empires of the Indus um, that inspired me to to come back to Britain and look around me at my own culture and and the bridges that need to be built there, and also the the leadership. I mean, I think that um, I remember when I was writing Empires of the Indus, I was had to go to Ladakh in India. Um, and I've been reading in all these ancient Greek Sanskrit texts about this land of women. And I kept thinking, wow, that would be so amazing. You know, a land of women ruled by women, a land ruled by women. And mm -hmm. I think there's a line in the Sanskrit text about if men go there, they get turned to stone or something. And so I was really, this was well, apart from Tibet, it was the penultimate place I went to on my, on my journey okay. um, along the Indus. And I get to, to Ladakh and it's so interesting. It's, it's as if what I say about deep history is that it, that it matters, you know, it, it exists. These, these deep, deep histories which go, be, go before um, partition, go before British um, colonization, go before, you know, you can, you can dive deep into these, into these histories. And I got to Ladakh and it, and it felt to me, and maybe it was my imagination, but I don't think it was, it, it, just the way that women were and the way they were speaking to each other, it had a different quality from, really? from, from, from other places I've been in, in the whole Indus Valley. And I thought, wow, this really is still a land of women. And it taught me that, that what you do, how you arrange your society and what you say and what you promote, um, who you bring together, you know, these things, what people do really matters. It really yeah. matters. And it taught yeah. me that, you know, I brought those lessons back home and I, and I began looking around at my own culture, British culture, where there are these ancient stories of, of islands ruled by women. And I've been looking ever since. I've been looking for these British islands ruled by women. And I, and I was thinking to myself, where the heck are they? They were in Ladakh. You know, there was this ancient, ancient land of women. And there it was in, the re in real time, in, in the contemporary times today. Where are these British islands ruled by women? And that's one of the reasons why I then had to go and write this book, to make them up. Um, so I think, you know, I really did learn a lot from, from, from this journey. Um, and I think collaborations, you know, obviously it's really the border is shut. And I always you can't yeah. do things like exchange programs. For example, if, if Scotland was to go independent soon, which it may well do, um, I would want you know literary residencies, exchange programs, all these, hopefully there won't be any physical closing of borders beyond pandemics um, within Britain. But um, you know, I used to work for Biblio, a review of books. That was my second job on arriving in Delhi. Um, and they had a collaboration um, with EU money, um, you know, Lindice and an Italian magazine, and they did a collaboration with the University of Amsterdam. Isn't that something maybe that could happen between India and Pakistan? Um, yeah, worth thinking or, about, absolutely. I mean, and yeah. uh, absolutely. Or prizes, or recipro reciprocal prizes. Um, absolutely. Was, yeah. yeah, so, really cool. uh, so I have to go on, move on to my last, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, panelist, Moni Mosin. Hi, Moni. Hello, can you see me? I can, mm -hmm. and uh, we, are, we are fellow Lahoris and we know each other so from before this panel. As an author, you're most well known for your Diary of a Social Butterfly columns in the Friday Times and uh, uh, the books that are a spin-off of that uh, a character. And uh, I feel more than anything else, humor has a way of kind of winging across borders or, or uh, you know, divides and social divides and things. And I think your books must be doing that. So, uh, so just tell me a bit about how Butterfly, I mean, you know, your character, in her own ditzy way, how she has crossed borders. What, I mean, you can be anecdotal if you want to be because you're great at uh, anecdotes. So uh, carry on. Um, so when I started writing the Diary of a Social Butterfly, I was writing it for the, as you said, for the Friday Times, which is a weekly newspaper, which comes out from Tahar. And I was writing basically about my own life, my own sort of truths, etc. what I saw around me. I had created this fictional character called the Butterfly and her husband who's Janu and her mother-in-law and, and a whole kind of thing around her, a whole um, social sphere around her. And I was writing about the ridiculousness of her life, all the contradictions in her life, but I was also doing 
doing something which has been mentioned earlier, which is I was sort of, I was um, uh, playing the witness, you know, of all, everything that was happening in Pakistan at the time, politically, socially, um, uh, financially, I was writing about those things, but seen from her very weird point of view, because she's a very privileged, very shallow, very superficial, um, at the same time, warm person. Um, so I was writing about Pakistan, I was getting quite a lot of feedback, etc. And then I was invited to the um, Jaipur Literary Festival. And I was absolutely unaware of the fact that it had found a um, an audience in India as well. I knew that it was being published in a newspaper, um, uh, every week um, after I wrote it, it was to come out there as well. But I didn't know that anybody was reading it. I had no idea. And I was approached by a publisher who said that, you know, she was interested in, in, the, in the column and would I consider putting it into a book? And I said, but who will read it? And she said, you'd be surprised. Um, I didn't know at all. Um, it, was, it came as a huge, delicious, pleasant surprise that it had found resonance in India. And I think now when I look back on it and I try and sort of figure out why that was so, it was because of something that Preeti said, it was something that Ikta said, it was something that Sheila said. It was, A, I was using the language that is common to the whole of the subcontinent. Anybody who speaks English speaks like that only. And we made our own language now, and it is our own. And you know, anybody who hears it, understands it, and is immediately familiar with it. And it kind of, it finds a, uh, 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 it finds a place in your, um, it, it's familiar. And as soon as something is familiar, it stops being scary. Um, and I also, um, humor, as you said, uh, plays a part. Humor lowers the temperature. It kind of thaws the ice. It makes, once you can laugh, you can let down your guard. You can allow this person into your life. And the butterfly is a quite an unthreatening person. She is, she's silly, um, she's ridiculous. She, she doesn't pose a threat. And therefore you can look at her, you can feel irritated by her. You can also recognize her and you can recognize yourself in her. Um, and I think that's what a lot of Indian readers did. The other thing that, um, you know, uh, we were talking also about uh, Pakistani plays and the reason why those found resonance in India many, many years ago was because this, the, they recognized all those tropes, you know, the, uh, the, um, the put upon daughter-in-law, uh, the hideous mother-in-law, uh, the interfering neighbor, uh, the friend who pretend, the frenemy, you know, may, yeah. may I just tell you one thing only, you know, just for you. And then, and, and, and you know how all this is know that the minute somebody says, don't mind, uh, you know, that a real stinger is coming your way. You know, those kind of things, they, they recognize those. And I think all of those occur in the butterfly as well. They are familiar tropes. Um, a while ago, I wrote an, uh, an article somewhere in India and I got back a response which really floored me um, and delighted me. A woman wrote and said, I've never been to Pakistan. I've never met you. And yet I feel I know you. Why is that? Uh, and I think it is because of all those things that uh, we share a humor. There was a lady who lives in now in America. She is in her 90s. Um, she is a great um, keen reader of Butterfly. She's Punjabi, she is Sikh. Um, and she left um, the subcontinent many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, she said to me, it's that humor that I used to hear as a child in Lahore. It has a resonance for me. The, the kind of self-deprecatory humor that is very particular to Punjabis. Um, and it's, it's uh, I don't know if that qualifies um, in, in Alice's uh, um, um, definition of a deep culture of it. Uh, mm -hmm. of, <laughs> so. yeah. But that humor is, is, I think, goes back centuries as well. Um, and it's, it's a way of communication that is not lost, that hasn't been lost even um, after 70 years of separation. And when people hear it, they immediately understand it and recognize it. I think another one other reason why um, the butterfly has been popular in Pakistan, uh, sorry, in India, is that uh, I, you know, um, 
I don't write as a Pakistani in that so much. She's not nationalistic. Uh, she is not. Uh, she is not what is called a patriot. She is uh, somebody who just wants to have a nice time, yeah. and um, she is um, therefore um, uh, the things that that Indians can identify with are not her ne necessarily her nationality, but the fact that she is a uh, ditzy house. By the fact that she's a mother, by the fact that she's a friend, by the fact that she is a, um, you know, she herself also feels uh, put upon and threatened, even though she is extremely privileged. Um, so all of those kind of things, I think, help people uh, to um, build bridges. In my new book, the, um, the Impeccable Integrity of Ruby R, which came out last month, again, I wrote about my own experience in Pakistan um, as a person who is living in a, uh, under a populist regime run by a demagogic kind of leader. Um, and I was I, did, I wasn't writing from the Indian point of view, but again, it found resonance because so many people said, we understand what you're writing about. I was writing about trolls and how they come for you and how journalists are silenced and how truth tellers are um, um, uh, vilified um, and how, you know, this whole idea of fake media and how women in particular are um, victimized. Um, because if a woman speaks her mind, if that yin um, uh, idea comes out, it immediately has a kind of, you know, um, pushback. Um, and again, um, I have received a huge um, response from Indian readers uh, saying, we are like this only, you know, <laughs> this is the same for us. Um, and again, I, I was not writing about them, I was writing about myself, but it just finds because we have we share so much. And if anything COVID has taught us is that we are in this together, you know? Um, if anything air pollution has taught us is that we are in this together. If anything that climate change has taught us, it is that we are in this together. Um, all of these issues which are, are you know, hitting all of us so painfully now, uh, uh, and particularly in the subcontinent, I think, because so much is, is shared, you know, our water comes from the same sources, our air is the same, our soil is the same, our monsoon is the same, our people are the same. Um, and um, I entirely agree with Ekta and I share her dream and I share her vision and I hope very much every time I go to places like um, Malaysia and Indonesia and, and Thailand, who can, you know, people can travel across each other's countries without even their passports, just an ID card, I feel such a sense of loss and such a sense of uh, what if, you know, and wistfulness at that idea. And I hope that it will not just remain an idea or as, as Ekta says, a dream. I hope it will become a reality in our lifetimes. Indeed. Thank you so much, Moni. That was amazing. I mean, you kind of summed it up. I really enjoyed this panel. And uh, I think all of you, I think you've kind of uh, laid out a network about, uh, and, and particularly in the beginning, this thing of this upsurge of the in sort of energy and I think we're all going towards, veering towards that and thinking that that women can be very effective uh, leaders or at least communicators. And uh, uh, what Ekta has done here is remarkable that she's got so many people together from all over. And uh, yes, I can, I can jump in there. So I echo, I just want to say also, what a rich conversation. Um, I completely agree, Mevash, there's so much that's a connecting thread between Yin intelligence and what all of your storytelling is doing. So Thank you so much, everybody. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs>